So now that we've completed looking at the gymnosperms, which are seeded plants that are also going to be part of the land plants that we look at, we're going to now shift gears and focus on the other side of this lecture, the majority of this lecture, which is focused on the angiosperms. So we'll entitle this first flowchart, Angiosperms 1. So first and foremost, just like we did for the gymnosperms, what we're going to be doing is a basic background uh, understanding of what the angiosperms are. First and foremost, what we have to understand is that the angiosperms, unlike the gymnosperms, which we covered in their diversity flowchart, they actually only have one phylum. So there's only one phylum that we need to worry about instead of the four that we saw in the gymnosperm diversity. And that one phylum is going to be referred to as the following. It is called anthophyta. Anthophyta. And remember, Phyta, this root of phyta, just simply means referring to plant or plant-like. Now, specifically, this phyla, phylum will contain seed plants that are going to be with something very, very important to their overall success and structure. So this will, of course, contain seed plants because we do end in this angiosperm sort of word right here, so that would mean that there's definitely seed involved. But the seed plants are going to be specifically with these important structures known as flowers, and fruits. So these are plants that bear flowers and bear fruits. Classic plants that most people think of whenever they think of the term or even the word plant. Something that has a flower or something that actually bears fruit. There are about 250,000 of these types of plants that have this characteristic. So 250,000 species. That's about 90% of all plants on planet Earth fall under this one phylum of the angiosperm, specifically anthophyta. So it's a very, very successful, very, very prominent group of plants. We're going to see why they're so prominent and successful as we move forward. And of course, these are going to be the most widespread of plants. Of course, just like I mentioned, this is about 90% of all living plants on Earth fall under the anthophyta uh, phylum. Okay, so that covers our background. Now, let's look at this idea of flowers and fruits in a little bit more detail, just so that we really understand what it means to possess a flower and to be an angiosperm for that reason. So, when we think of the term flower or flowers that the angiosperms possess, what we're going to say is the following. Flowers are specialized structures... So we're looking at very specialized, very differentiated, specific structures devoted to a specific process and a very important process for success of any organism, success of any living thing. The specialized structures are going to be specifically for sexual reproduction. And so now we know that these plants are going to be highly specialized because of their structure, the flower structure, in the function of sexual reproduction. So structure and function, again, like I always say, play a big role together simultaneously. Furthermore, flowers are specifically going to be referred to as not just specialized structures, but we actually can subclassify flowers as specifically specialized shoots. That's the technical plant term that we'll use here. And shoots are just things above ground. Anything on the plant that's above ground you would consider that part of the shoot of the plant. So specialized shoots are going to be things above ground that are specially created, specially structured for sexual reproduction in angiosperms because we're talking about flowers and that automatically means we're talking about angiosperms. Now, furthermore, there are going to be four types of specific structures within the flower that we need to remember. And I'm going to say that there are going to be up to four types four types of what we call sporophylls, and this is a term we've seen before. Remember, when we say sporophylls, we simply are referring to modified leaves, right? There's going to be four modified leaves within the flower structure that are going to be called flower organs. So we'll say called flower organs. So a flower contains four major parts all of which are each a flower organ. And that's going to be all modified leaf structure. So let's see the modifications to the leaf that we see. First and foremost, the number one oh, that most people understand of, uh, that sort of starts our understanding of flower shoots, is, are the sepals. And sepals are simply going to be the things that are at the flower base. So they're at the flower base, not the plant base specifically, but at the base of the flower structure. 
what we simply mean by sepals are these are going to be usually a green in color. So they're going to be characteristically green. They're going to be the structures that most people know of that, that actually enclose the plant, specifically enclose the flower before it opens. And many people have seen sepal structures when a flower, before it actually opens up, it's enclosed in this green surrounding thing. That's called the sepal. And that's a type of sporophyll, which is a part of the overall flower structure. So this is going to enclose flower before it opens. Okay, before it opens. In addition, it's going to actually be a sterile, sterile floral organ meaning that it is not going to directly be involved in any sort of sexual reproduction. Specifically, when we say sterile, we simply mean that it does not produce, the sepals don't produce any sort of sperm or egg. Though they are a part of a reproductive structure that does, in the end-all, be-all scenario, produce sperm and egg, this specific part of it, this specific flower organ, this specific type of sporophyll, on the overall shoot structure, does not produce sperm and egg, thus we call it sterile. Now the next type that we're going to be looking at are the petals. So number two would be the petals. Now many people already know what petals are, flowers. These are the characteristic structures that most flowers have. Petals are going to be uh, most of the time brightly colored, so they're very characteristic and there's a reason for this, which we'll get to in just a second. Most are brightly colored, and the reasoning behind this is because it's an attractive mechanism. When something is brightly colored, uh, in most cases, specifically in the cases of plants, this is going to be a very, very attractive thing that's going to specifically attract pollinators. And this is crucial for the life cycle and success of angiosperms. This is part of the reason they're so successful, is that they can easily attract pollinators that can help transfer pollen. And remember, the transfer of pollen is a specific part of life and success for any plant because life is all about survival and reproduction. Transferring pollen is a specific reproductive necessity that has to happen. And if you can do anything to promote this transfer, aka have petals that are brightly colored, that are attractive to pollinators, you will be successful as we can see already based off of what we established in terms of how many species we see. Now, in addition, sometimes you don't even need to attract pollinators. Sometimes the petals are going to be uh, on wind-pollinated flowers. So these are going to be flowers that don't need to necessarily attract anybody. The wind itself will pick up the pollen and let it disperse um, over the flower. So these are the petals that are usually not brightly colored. So, so we'll say no bright colors. So there are exceptions to this bright colored rule. Most are brightly colored, but some are not. And if they're not brightly colored, you can automatically assume that that flower is definitely wind pollinated because it, of course, uses wind for what process? For the process of pollination. Remember, pollination is different than fertilization, and we'll touch on that as we move forward. Another thing to know about the petals, this is actually a sterile organ. Meaning that, just like we stated before in the sepal story, anything that's sterile in plants simply does not produce sperm and egg, though it could be a part of the overall production, as we'll see later. Now, the last part that we'll cover in this video, and we'll summarize the final uh, type of sporophyll in the next video, is the stamen. So this will be number three. The stamen is what's going to be uh, the male sort of part of the flower, because this is where we have the production of microspores. So the stamen produces microspores. We already know that whenever we see microspores, that's referring to the male gametes. Thus, this is going to eventually develop into, just like we saw in gymnosperms, microspores eventually develop into the male gametophyte, which is, in this case, the pollen grain. And remember, the pollen grain contains those two important cells. Just to reiterate, this is the male gametophyte. So this is going to be directly involved in sexual reproduction. Thus, we have certainly established that definition of specialized structures for sexual reproduction. This is going to aid in that. This is going to aid in that. Both of these are indirect aids. This is more of a direct part of the sexual reproduction that flowers use. So the stamen, microspores, turns into pollen grain, male gametophyte. That's the story there. And uh, more specifically, we can just conclude by the fact that the stamen consists of a 
filament region, which is simply just the stalk of the plant. So a very sort of nicely and strongly structured part of the plant. And it also contains a part of the plant that we're actually somewhat familiar with so far, known as the anther. The anther, just to define it, is simply the terminal sac where pollen is produced. So the final, most, most uh, latter part of this plant, the, specifically the flower, the terminal, meaning the end sac, where pollen is produced. So it's the ultimate sort of end-all, be-all place for pollen production, where pollen produced. And that covers our first look at angiosperms. We'll continue our discussion and, some, and complete our discussion on the sporophyll modified leaf structures that are flower organs in the next video.